we're talking about doctrinal conclusions. And it is my contention that it's only doctrinal conclusions that will help anyone, and that includes saved, spirit-filled uh, uh, people through times of distress and trouble. Now, doctrinal conclusions are those conclusions that we come to in life based upon the accurate things we have learned up to this point. Now, as part of that, we have what's known as the law of antecedents and successions. That simply means that uh, you haven't arrived at this uh, point in your life on your own. Uh, there were things that happened beforehand that give you your present reality. Uh, you have been born, you were raised at a certain place, certain amount of education, you now work a certain job, and so forth. There are antecedents coming to this point. But you have to remember that there are also things that have gone before, that's what an antecedent is, that bring you to this point in your life spiritually. And every moment of every day, you must make decisions based on those antecedents. And in fact, God deals with you with regard to where you are at that moment. Once you make a decision, it sets in motion certain things called successions. Now, you can, inside of you, either believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, or you can reject Him. Or you can embrace the will of God, or you can um, disregard it for your life. You can be positive, or you can be negative. We contend that those decisions set up a chain reaction so that God then deals with you based on that succession, and the next time that he talks with you, he goes back to that antecedent. Now, what I mean by that is if you were positive here, you go, and then the next time he talks with you, it's a little easier for him to deal with you. This is your status. This is where you are based on the ante antecedents. And you can accept that and go a little, draw, be drawn a little closer to him until, of course, you are saved or uh, uh, spirit-filled or what have you. However, on the other end of the spectrum, God speaks to you and you say, I don't need you, God. And then the next time he comes to you, it's, uh, it becomes easier for you to say no. It becomes harder for God to say, won't you please accept uh, uh, me as your Savior? Won't you please trust in me? Until it comes to the time when your heart is totally hardened and you cannot be saved. This is the procedure to salvation where he softens it, known as having mercy or compassion on whom he will. And on whom he will, he hardens. Those who will reject him, he begins this process of judgment. Now, we know these things as the law of volitional responsibility. You have a will. You have options. You have choices in life. Now, one of the choices that, that uh, you have right now, and we're, we're speaking to all of us um, in, the, in the sense of, um, of a loss, somebody that we love, somebody like our beloved Tom. Okay, we can charge God foolishly. Why did you let this happen? Didn't you know you've ruined my future? Didn't you know how I felt about him and become very bitter toward God? God, you're incompetent. You don't know what you're doing. And you begin to harden your heart. Well, the next time God deals with you, he's going to take that into consideration. And then the next time someone else dies <laughs> close to you, uh, he's going to say, do you remember all the bitterness rancor of soul that you displayed toward me? Do you uh, remember how you charged me then? Why? And there's your antecedent. Why should I help you now when I tried to help you at a certain time and you rejected my aid? On the other hand, you can be like Job in all these things. Now, can you imagine? He lost his fortune. He lost his herds. He lost 10 kids, seven sons and three daughters. And the first thing he did when the news came was not get bitter toward, why did you let this happen? He bowed down and worshiped and said, naked came I out of, out of my mother's womb, naked I'll return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord took away, blessed be the name of the Lord. In all these things, God, uh, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. He realized that God has a plan for all of our lives, which includes a birth and a death and things in between. And so therefore, he never did get bitter with God. In fact, <laughs> and we always laugh at this, 
Uh, he took his family, but the only thing he left behind was a very nagging wife who said to him, why don't you, <laughs> you know, of all things, take my wife, don't take the kids. They didn't cause me any problem. But no, this, this was a wife who nagged him quite a bit. And uh, why don't you just curse God and die? Be bitter in your soul toward God and just, just die. Curse him to his face. Well, Job said, wait a second. You're talking as the foolish, unbelieving women do. Shall we not in this life take good from the hand of God as well as the evil? We're in the angelic conflict here. Our purpose is, uh, goes far beyond our measly existence. And if God sends us a little trouble along the way, we can still accept that trouble in his graces and in strength and glorify him, you see. He never hardened his heart. Now, to be sure, uh, this gal was bitter at the loss of her ten children. But Job was not. She sinned. He did not. That is the law of volitional responsibility and antecedents. Things happened, 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 happened to Job, and it only drove him closer to the heart of God. Things happened, happened, happened to his wife, and it only drove her further away, you see. It just depended on how they used their volition. Now, she was a, uh, not a student of God's word. He, of course, was. And it involves the law of cause and effect and sowing and reaping. And uh, I had to stand corrected this morning and with my... Uh, the planting of a wheat seed and getting a wheat crop, planting of a corn seed and getting a corn crop. And Brian Maver said that's, that's not uh, true in every case. You have to qualify that. He said, because I tried planting bird seed and I never did get a robin. But <laughs> yes, I, I can see. So uh, <laughs> anyway, we're going to move on here. What does that mean? That means in life, human viewpoint eventually ends up to be very illogical. And that's how most people think. Their antecedents have rejected God to this point, And so when trouble comes, they don't know where to turn. That's why um, you know, I'm sure, and some had mentioned afterwards that uh, oh, they're going to probably think we're weird at our church. Uh, there they are crying and yet at the same time rejoicing that, that Tom has died. No, Tom has entered the gates of heaven uh, where there's no crying, no pain, no sorrow, no more death, no more parting. It's a, a, a time of bliss for him and happiness beyond compare. We certainly would not want to call him back. In fact, someone has suggested, and I believe they're right, that when Jesus Christ wept at the tomb of Lazarus, he was weeping that he had to call him back from heaven into this life. I think that's, that's correct. He was there and he wept before the tomb. Why did, why did he weep? Because he was calling him back from heaven. That's why. Uh, David said regarding the child that died. Sovereign grace of God takes over the child beyond uh, 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 ahead of uh, the age of accountability. The child goes straight to heaven and David said, I cannot bring him back, but I shall go to be with him. I'm going to go to join him, you say, and that should be our viewpoint. So when we come up with a theological view of life, people just don't understand. People fall apart, but we sorrow not as others which have no hope. Why? Because we can apply things like theological syllogisms. Syllogisms have three components, major and minor premise leading to a conclusion. All right. What is our major premise? Isaiah 46. Verse number nine, remember the former things of old. I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. All right, the last part of verse number 11, I have spoken it, I will bring it to pass, I have purposed it, I also will do it. So how am I gonna get help when things fall apart in my life, I go to a major premise. I was not always here, but somebody was here before me, the ultimate antecedent God. He created and put into effect a plan which has, which has laws and, and relationship causes and effects. Therefore, our uh, major premise based on this is God has designed and now controls history. And that includes me. Do you know you're here because you were thought of 
years ago. We're talking billions and billions of years ago. And I'm quoting a man, Carl Sagan, who I believe was an atheist or an agnostic, and uh, his billions and billions of years is not far enough back for him because if he, if he didn't trust Christ as his Savior, we know where he is. But the major premise in history is that I am here now, and I'm here now because God has designed history, controls it, and has brought things to bear to bring me to this point. I am. I have been born. I exist. I can think. I can make decisions. So history includes me. Now, I, I don't know if, um, if that does anything to, to your heart, but I'm glad that out of the list of names that he had that he was going to end up creating in human history, one of them had wasn't written on a slip of paper and fell off his desk and he seemed to forgot, uh, uh, forget about them. He did not. Every single name that he wanted to create has been or will be created. All right, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, for our minor premise. Human history, by God's design, has both good times and bad times. And by the way, um, I, I didn't know we were going to sing that song uh, this morning. Uh, the good times and the bad times, the God of the mountains, God of the valleys, day and night, and so forth. But it's part of, of the minor premise that, we're, that we contend. Good and bad circumstances are inexistent for all. He causes the sun to shine and uh, the rain to fall on whom? The just and the unjust. There are good times, there are bad times for all of us. But ultimate victory only for those who love him. All right, note Ecclesiastes chapter 3. To everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. This is why I always contend. It is not if you and I are going to die. It is a matter of when. It is an appointment. Uh, therefore, as, as much as I dread going to uh, people like the dentist or to the doctor for a, a shot, uh, a lot of folks dread death. And the reason is it's a shot in the dark for them. They don't know where they're going. They have no assurance uh, beyond the veil. But note what he says. There's a time to be born for every person and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, uh, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break up, a time to uh, break down, rather, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, and so forth. On and on we could go. God has built into his system good times and bad times for everyone. You cannot evade it. You cannot avoid it. You cannot circumvent it. Uh, you cannot hope that, that, uh, that somehow you're going to be exempt from the system, for you are not. Nobody ever has. It's the law of cause and effect, uh, and effect antecedents and successions. And where you are with regard to your attitude toward God and the use of your volition is the only thing that can sustain you through both times of life. Prosperity proves to be a, a, a time, difficult time for a lot of people. What do I mean? Well, as soon as they're richer, a little more comfortable, a little more money in the bank, they begin thinking that I'm a self-made person. I don't need God. It wasn't God who gave me all these things. I work for it. I don't need him. And so therefore, I don't need church. I don't need his word. I don't need to depend upon him. I don't need to pray. I don't need to study and so forth. Prosperity is a test as well as poverty. Good times can be a test as well as the bad times. But they're built into the system. And to think that you and I are never going to face them is to live in that fantasy land that most people live in. Well, what is the conclusion then? Romans chapter 8. The conclusion is, if I am saved, therefore, and in fellowship... God, by his design and control, works things out for my good, whether they are good or whether they are bad. 
Verse number 28. Here is the doctrine that Jesus Christ controls history around a pivot of faithful believers that form a remnant according to his grace. And we know that all things work together for good. Even the bad times are for our good and for his glory. To them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Now, that's how you should think. Even though the times are rough, you have to understand that you are part of a greater plan. That is the major premise. God didn't mistakenly allow your existence. He, uh, he called for your existence. You're here at his uh, beckoning hand, not, a, not on your own. Next, because you are part of this, and this is what Job understood, we are going to receive in the angelic conflict in our lives good times from God and bad times from God. But we're not going to criticize him because Good or bad, God is going to take those circumstances and turn them around for our good, our eventual eternal reward if we, if we love him. Conclusion, it's God who's working all, all these things out for my good. Even the times of loneliness and despair, the times of depression, it's for my good. Why? Because just like with Job... We, we come, here is the antecedent. Somebody has died in our family. Somebody we care about has gone on before. Here is the antecedent. This is where we are. Now, what are we going to do with it? Job's wife said, curse God and die. Harden yourself. Be obstinate. Blame him as an incompetent sovereign. What does he know? And Job said, I'm not going to do it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he bowed down and he worshiped him. One glorified God uh, in their belief, the other glorified God in his judgment of them. All right, that brings us then to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. This is what we call the faith rest technique. While everybody else is falling apart, while everybody else is wringing their hands and, and saying, oh, what am I going to do? What a tragedy. Those of us who know of the Lord and have antecedents in our life. What antecedent? We have determined in our life to inculcate the word of God to our, our human spirit. Therefore, we call it to mind. We claim a promise that stabilizes your mind. Uh, Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace, uh, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. But what have I just done? Somebody, somebody has died. A tragedy has happened. I have suffered loss. I have claimed a promise that stabilized my mind. Now, wait one second. I need, I need peace and stability. Who gives it to me? Thou, God, will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Be, the antecedent was, I have taken the time in my life to learn that verse, so with, when the tragedy came, I could call it to my life. So therefore, part of the faith rest technique, you'll never have a, a rest. You'll always be disturbed. You'll always have turmoil in your soul, unless you can claim a promise that stabilizes your mind. The second thing you need, need uh, uh, to do is use refer, reverse concentration in a doctrinal uh, rationale. Now, before we get there, we're in the book of Hebrews. Let's look at verse number 7, chapter 3. As the Holy Ghost said, Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And we've just been there. As in the day of the provocation of the temptation of the wilderness, your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works, but I was grieved with that generation because they do always err in their hearts. 
They have not known my way, so I swear in my wrath they'll not enter into my rest. Now, what did they do? Chapter 4, verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Moses provided adequate information for them to live a life pleasing to the Lord. They should have been stabilized. They should have known. God said, this word is going to give you my rest. You'll know my attitude, my supervising hand, my providential workings in all of your life. Here is the word, believe it, trust in me. But they would not believe it and they hardened their heart. That was their antecedent. And what did God say? I'm grieved with this generation. I keep coming to them. They, they call upon me and, I, and, and they prove me and then they turn their backs on me. And eventually that whole generation died out in the wilderness and a new generation went into the promised land. But note what it says in verse 12. Chapter 3, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, bitterness toward God, in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, the deceitfulness of sin is just simply what Job's wife thought that somehow if Job and she only banded together in cursing God, that they could beat God at his system and come out all right. Not so. Job understood the issue. Verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. In other words, the benefits of the cross, the benefits of spiritual strength come to us if we just simply believe it, if we persevere, if we stay true, while it is said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of the, pro uh, of the provocation. All right, come down to verse number 18. To whom swear God that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of their unbelief. However, if you'll come to chapter number four, verse number nine. Note what it says. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, this is where we get the concept of the faith rest technique. The word of God was presented to them, but it did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith. Because they didn't have faith, they couldn't enter into his rest. They hardened their hearts and God judged them. All right. But for the people of God who believe in him and trust in him, they say, God, your will be done. They totally rest and rely upon the sovereign providence of God. They merge their will with his will. They claim a promise he has given. It's his word. His integrity is at stake. And it stabilizes their mind in the midst of, of, a, of a bad circumstance, the storms of life. All right, let's come back to Romans chapter 8. Very quickly here because I'd... Romans chapter 8. We can... Go through this and um, uh, quickly and, and come to a conclusion, satisfactory conclusion, I hope, that will help us all. The next thing we need to do, once that uh, tidal wave hits us, once the earth quakes beneath our feet, once uh, uh, our life has been destabilized, the first thing we do with the faith rest technique is claim that verse that stabilizes our mind. The second thing we do is begin the process. We know it as reverse concentration. We have concentrated to get the word of God in our lives. Now we concentrate to get it out our lives. And this is called a doctrinal rationale. Look, if you will, at verse number 29. 
For whom, this is Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Verse 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. All right, here is your doctrinal rationale. Foreknowledge. What is the doctrine of foreknowledge, you think, as you are recalling these things to your mind? God thought about me in eternity past. He knew I would exist. He knew all the antecedents leading up to this point, and he knew the options and, uh, and the um, direction my will would take. Upon a positive reaction, God predestined me. Predestination does not mean he says you're going to be saved. He chooses you after you are saved for the privileged part of his plan. Now, EP is eternity past. God's plan for me since eternity past. He foreknew me, therefore he said, he's going to make a positive choice. I am going to choose him, therefore, for the privileged part of the plan. But that took place before your existence, in fact, before the foundation of the world. Therefore, the next thing, and we read them right here, election. God chose me for privilege. Or God, uh, excuse me, God had a plan for me since eternity past. Predestination, election is God chose me or called me to the place of privilege. It is a military term, front and center. I'm going to decorate you and reward you. You have a, a special place for me. That's election. Justification. Justification is something that can only happen in time based on the response of your will to the gospel or the response of your will to Bible doctrine. God can bless you in time. In fact, if you're, if you're saved, he can do it. Now, this is known, and I'll, I'll just say this quickly. This is known as an a fortiori argument. Now, what is that? If God has done something that is harder for him to do, he can, with greater reason, a fortiori, do something that is easier for him to do. Let's just look, verse, um, verse number 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The hardest thing for God to do was to judge his son on the cross for our sins. It becomes easier, therefore, with greater reason, we should know that because he did the hardest for us, he's naturally going to be able to do the easiest for us. And he has blessed us in time. That's harder. But it says, if he blessed us in time, justification, he has also chosen to glorify us. That is a little easier. It's easier for God to glorify people in eternity. No sin nature, no curse on the environment and so forth. So God can bless me in eternity. Now I've given this illustration before. If uh, you have seen me, just a, 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 you know, a, a seen me testify to the fact that I did say 10 push-ups then you know a fortiori with greater reason, I probably can do five. If I can do the harder, I can do that which is least difficult. And since God has done that which is most difficult in judging his son, it's easier to bless us now in time and it's easier to bless us now in eternity. That is a doctrinal rationale. He thought about me, he planned for me, he chose me, he blessed me now and he'll bless me later because all of these things are progressively easier for God to do. He's done the most difficult, it's now easier. What is the doctrinal conclusion? Verse number 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? The most difficult circumstances uh, in life still cannot destroy a believer who is resting upon the grace of God to see him through. Verse number 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. Verse number 38, 37. Nay, in all these things, the difficult things of life, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. I am persuaded, this is a doctrinal conclusion, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What have we just done? We have presented things to you that you can understand with your mind, embrace, 
and rest upon. That is the faith rest technique.